Hey everyone, it's Holly Homer and I am super excited about tonight because we are talking SEO and that's kind of what I like to talk about. So <laughs> I'm I'm just gonna be I already have my like notes, so I'm gonna be listening a lot and um, just soaking up the knowledge. And um, if you don't know me, I um, run two blogs, Business to Blogger and also Kids Activities blog. And I also have some friends with me tonight, so um, I'll just let everyone introduce themselves. Let's start with Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie Reimer. I blog at Hands On As We Grow. Uh, I'm here to pick these brains over here <laughs> about SEO. I'm nerdy like that, and I love the back end stuff of blogging, so I want to learn more. Um, I fear I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of SEO the way it is, so I'm just I don't know. I want to. Make sure I know what I'm doing, I guess. <laughs> I love that. I think that's what we're all, like, we have enough knowledge to be dangerous. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> so what about you, Jillian? Um, I'm Jillian Riley, and I am at a mom with a lesson plan. Um, I am opposite of you guys. I feel like SEO, bleh, you know, something <laughs> have a really hard time with, and I am trying to figure it out. I think it's going to take me to the next level if I can, so... I think we'll, we'll try to convert you tonight, yeah. <laughs> and Megan. I'm Megan, and I have a blog, coffeecupsandcrayons.com, and I have a lot of questions. I definitely have the little bit of knowledge is dangerous thing, and so I tend to go with whole new plans a lot that I would like to stop <laughs> doing. So, yes. And I also love to tag Nathan and ask him all of my questions to get answers. So I'm excited to have him sitting right near me to get the quick answer right here. <laughs> yeah, um, poor Nathan and Steve. Like once, like we knew them. Yeah, it's over for them. So why don't you guys introduce yourself? <laughs> um, all right, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Nathan Byloff. Um, partners with Steve Hammer. Uh, we co-founded Rank Hammer here in Dallas, Texas. We are a full-service digital marketing agency. Uh, we support a lot of people uh, with their PPC and SEO needs. Um, I'm pretty, pretty um, heavily on the technical side. Um, my background is uh, was always development, but I got into SEO like seven years ago, and I've been doing it ever since. And I guess that leaves last uh, and least in this case, which would be me, uh, Steve Hammer. Am I coming through at all? Mm -hmm, you are. Answering? Okay, good. Um, my job, um, I co-founded Rank Hammer. Um, we uh, were, as, as Nathan mentioned, we're a full-service SEO firm. One of the big things, uh, and PPC, uh, one of the big things we love to do in particular, I'm more on the business and creative side uh, of the business. Uh, coming through both traditional media and uh, a couple startups, so uh, you know we kind of we yin and yang a lot about things, um, but that makes us a really good team for uh, for the way we we approach things. Well, we really appreciate you guys being brave enough to face this panel. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, so the first thing that happened when I put out this invitation tonight. And oh, by the way, if you have questions, go ahead and add them to the event page. I'll be watching that um, tonight as we talk. So the first thing was when is like we figured out the Google keyword tool was going away and mass panic has gone out um, amongst bloggers. So um, Nathan or Steve, whichever wants to feel this, um, should we be panicking or can we live through this? I'll jump into that one. Um, in particular, no, you should, first of all, not only not be panicking, you, you should actually be rejoicing. And I know that's a really weird thing to say because a lot of us are very, very much used to uh, the keyword tool the way it was. Um, the, the only problem with it was the old keyword tool was really easy to use wrong. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to bounce over to a screen share really fast and kind of show some examples really quick if that's okay. So let me see if I can get this right here. That's not the one I wanted. That is the one I wanted. So taking this example, I, I just did um, the, uh, the keyword, ah, I've got to find it, school shoes for one example. This is a great you know, kind of thing that you'd want to target. Uh, it's pretty interesting. This is the, the trends search. Can, can everyone see that? that? Is that visible? Yeah, I can, yeah, I can see 
Okay, good. Um, I'm, I, so that's trends, and you can see how that bounces around um, quite a lot. When you take a look at it, I mean, it, it hits these peaks, right, when, when back to school happens. That's, that's what you want to see for, for a seasonal keyword, things that are there. Um, this is a great source for kind of looking for uh, broad, broad kind of keywords that you might want to target. And in addition in this thing, you can see, as you scroll down, some related terms. I tend to start a lot of my keyword research um, even before here, but now it's, it's almost a month. So I'm going to bounce over to the other keyword tool in a second here, if I can get to the right window. And... Okay, just lost the screen share, and now we're going to go back to it, to another window that I have open. Hey, can, um, can, can we all... Are you guys seeing my picture pop up? I'm seeing some of your guys' yeah. pictures pop up. It, will it so the keyword tool... Will it help if we mute our microphones while he's talking? Yeah, everybody should, can do that. So this is, a, this is a good example. So I did the same search over here in the old keyword tool. So what this thing would show you is school shoes. We did the same search. You can see the global monthly searches and the local monthly searches. And it looks like you don't get the seasonality quite as easily. It's, the data was there if you added the column, um, but most people didn't. Um, and most people did the search this way, meaning they just did a default search, um, which I'm going to do really quickly again. And you'd look at that volume and go, wow, 135,000, medium competition. This, this is a great word for me to, to be targeting. Um, the problem is that's not, that's not the reality of what that search is. It's closer to this, which is the exact search, which it was easy to, to miss, um, which is actually considerably lower. If you look down here, you can see that number is about a tenth of that. Uh, for the exact search of school shoes. A lot of the other stuff actually rolls into boys' school shoes or girls' school shoes or school uniform shoes or some of those other related terms. And then the other equivalently important thing is I've targeted the, lo the locations of the United States. Um, the local monthly searches for that really drop off. For some reason, that seems to be something that's targeted a lot out of the United States. I don't know why. I just happened to, to pick that one. The same can be said over here. This is the new keyword planner. I've done the same search over here, and you'll see I don't have an option for broad match anymore. It's all exact match, and I have the average monthly searches of 1,300. In here, the default of it automatically shows me um, I can just scroll over and get some of these uh, monthly trends, and I can see, wow, holy cow, that's a big thing in August. I, if I'm going to write about that, I want to do that right now. Very much, I think it's a lot easier to understand. Um, as well as some you know, the exact match volume for them, so you know what people are actually searching for rather than sort of the, the variety of that. Um, also here, if you want to take it up to a higher level, what you can see is aggregated, the ad groups aggregate some of this stuff. So Shoes Online has a massive search volume. It's also very, very competitive, as you can well imagine. But School Uniform, um, a little less, and is, is a little less competitive, and again, it has that same seasonality, probably relates to, to the two. Um, the other really cool thing, if you are not just United States targeted, if you are a, just a Dallas area individual, you can get that data a little bit better than you used to be able to by just targeting the areas that you care about. We used to always think that you would type in, um, you can see all the numbers, I just typed it in and the numbers went down, um, we, you used to kind of have to guess, well, Dallas is 3% of the population, about how much does that look like? Now it actually tells me um, what that volume reduces down to, which is a, which is a huge advantage uh, for, for regionalization. And you can see in this case um, that the keyword Dallas Plus doesn't necessarily show up. If I type in she, she, school shoes Dallas, which is the way we used to think everybody searched, um, and they don't, it, it's off the radar. Nobody does that. Does that all make sense? I know that's a long, long thing to say that that this is actually a really, really good thing. So, um, I mean, is there a reason why they did that, or is it just getting? Is it just an improvement? Do you think? Um, 
Why do I think they did it? Um, yeah. I think it's a couple things. One, I do think it's a lot of people were using it wrong um, when they did that, the broad match term. The, the classic is actually the word blog. When people would search, they'd search for the word blog and they'd say, Uh oh. A million Has hits. Well, not blog any time. The, the, the other thing to remember is these guys are also. Did I just die? Yeah, you're 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 fading, but you're there still there. <laughs> okay, good. Um, the other thing is obviously um, these um, these guys are really about the advertising. They're not really about supporting SEO. They're, that's a that's a benefit and a bonus to them um, that it, that we can use it. So they want paid search advertisers the most to, to be there. That's actually data from paid search impressions, which is an important thing to remember. Even when they talk about competition, it's paid search competition. Um, you may see competition low in that tool. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy for you to rank for it, because that just means it's not a very commercial term. It could still have Disney or um, CNN or other people that are actually in that search result page, um, even for a low, a low competition terms in terms of the AdWord tool. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think this kind of goes into um, another thing that we wanted to talk about tonight is, is you know, using keywords for SEO versus using keywords like bloggers do to just try to increase traffic. Yeah, there, there's a big line there, and it, it's um, it, it's almost the line between social media and and SEO. People search differently than when they have they have intent when they search. They want something very very specific. I'm going to use a specific piece of content and bounce back over to the screen share again. Um, I'll be doing this a lot tonight, sorry. Um, but you don't have to look at me at the undisclosed location, which is probably actually a little bit better um, in, in some regards. So um, I'm going to, ugh, wrong one, sorry. I, I have a, as, every, as Nathan can share, I have a bit of a, a, a tab problem. I, I like way too many of them, uh, open all the time. I, I think we have that in common. I'm still trying to figure out which one I'm, what window I'm supposed to be on at the moment. Uh, uh, so I'm just going to type this in here. So this is this is an in, uh, an infographic. I know infographics have you know their reputation for what they are. This is something people aren't searching for necessarily. Um, but I wanted to throw that out there. This is a good example of content that is not really very very good about. Um, search. Do you can you imagine searching washroom soap? It's not going to happen. Um, but can washroom soap make you sick? Has a great hook, right? It's um, when I when I see that I'm like, whoa, holy cow, you know. And then you, you sort of sort of flip down this, and you and you you don't even have to go very far to see that one in four um, of these things is content. Whoa, okay, like you, you know what I mean. This is not the type of content that is going to search well. Um, but it's the type of content that would social well. Mm -hmm. And Gojo kind of knows that within this one. And I'm just using the, these guys as an example because it's it's a convenient one that's sort of at my at my disposal. Something like school shoes, which is the other example I used, is something people are searching for. There's an intent there. I need to go get shoes for my my kid. How do I find great places to buy them? How do I find um, find great sources? Can I find used ones? Are used ones okay? Blah, 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 whatever else the case may be. Because there's a there's a little bit more of a of a purchase um, a purchase area there, right? Mm -hmm. So those are the things that um, that you kind of have to separate yourself out. If if no one's searching for it, it doesn't mean it's not valid content. As a matter of fact, it still can be incredible content. Um, actually, probably in a lot of cases, it is. You just have to count on people um, being on your blog in the first place, which is a good thing. So if I were Gojo, the thing I would recommend here is if they had a blog that was talking about other things that people do search more, this goes in other things you might be might find interesting. Mm -hmm. You get this second page view with content that people aren't searching for. You get the first one sometimes. Yeah, I think that's something that we often forget. In fact, um, Jamie... At least. Jamie had a question um, about high monthly searches versus low. Um, Jamie, you want to talk? Ask well, it's, it was kind of on what you were talking about before, I think, um, about when we search for, 
whenever I used the keyword planner I, or the keyword tool I always used went for high impressions versus low competition. And somebody I think in this thread actually for this event mentioned that it could be it was more for AdSense, which I know that's what the keyword tool is actually for, uh, is for AdWords. That if they have high and or high competition, it means that more ads are going to be showing on your page. You're not going to have blank ads or better paying ads, maybe. So it doesn't really matter when it comes to high versus low um, competition when we're trying to fight for SEO purposes. Or yeah, not. that's correct. I don't know correct. if that's a question or not. No, it is a question. It, that 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 is actually something that's one of the most because it's designed for AdWords advertisers. It's actually one of the mi most sort of misleading mm -hmm. things in the whole tool. Um, you don't you're you're it. That's how comp competitive that term is. Um, like I said, you could have something uh, that is really really low competition, but CNN and Disney and these other people are all in that same space. Um, you're like, oh wow, I don't. You know, that takes, takes some serious domain authority to be able to show up against those guys, right? Um, there's two two ways to kind of do it. Actually, do the search yourself, right? Actually, Just look at what's there. Up. That's a um, certainly simple enough, right? See what's there. And the second thing is look at look at other tools that that can corroborate that. Moz has a great one. They the keyword difficulty tool, which I understand they're revising a little bit, helps a little bit about that. Nathan, do you have anything you want to add about the Moz tool lately? Since we were both there. Um, no, I haven't used the Moz keyword tool, or I haven't seen the changes that they're talking about yet. Um, the Uber suggests, though, that you had mentioned once in the past, and I, I live by that. I always jump on that thing. That um, is that. I don't know if that's hooked into into AdWords itself, but that is another uh, good way. Okay. Well, and the other thing that came up in this thread, and I have no idea if this is true or not is if we do get lucky and rank for one of these high dollar ones, would that make a difference with our AdSense as far as the ads coming in? Typically, yes, but not always. Um, AdSense does look at what the content is on your page and tries to match up well for it. Uh, but the, there's de so there's definitely a correlation. If you're writing about home mortgages, right, and uh, a particularly high value keyword and you had home mortgage ads around it, those clicks are going to be much better than they would be, say, writing about, um, well, girl shoes or something like that, where there's still value there, but it's, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit lower. So there is a, there is a correlation between the two, but it's not necessarily always going to be the case that what it decides, um, is the most relevant for your content is actually what you're writing about. You could write about home, your experience with a home mortgage and it could still show an ad because of the other content on your site or other things that are on there that's unrelated to mortgages, um, which may have a much lower click volume because they think they'll get that click, um, which is what they're playing for. I see. Um, and let's stop right here. And Dinah, um, welcome. Yeah, <laughs> um, thank sorry. You. Yourself. And then um, if, I know you have a question about tags that you wanted to ask these guys. Oh, yeah. As far as um, internal linking goes, um, is it better to link to a specific post versus a tag or a category? Um, me, personally, I don't use tags at all. I think it, those tags and categories, unless you do them properly, they almost look like duplicate content. Because if you, you got your blog stream right there and all and all your contents there, and when you jump around to these tags and categories, um, unless you're customizing those pages um, yourself with different graphics or different like headline text or something like that, something to um, discern it from these actual other streams where it's essentially the same as just the same post reorganized I would put I would link to the individual um, posts than those actual tags and category pages unless unless you do unless you've kind of optimized and you've upgraded those pages so they're um, they're more rich in content because hmm. so, uh, that was my next question is if, if they were considered duplicate content or not so you know as a blogger the, all of us I'm sure have a ton of tags and categories organized so now there's like a panic button in my head saying <laughs> do I have to reorganize everything or do I have to make 
you know, um, a hub, a page of. I don't know if category. you really, WordPress is large enough that Google knows the way it works, knows the way it's laid out. Um, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't panic. Um, I might, I mean, it might be an idea to, to separate yourself to create a hub page um, or to customize it a little bit more, um, but I definitely wouldn't panic. <laughs> yeah, and Since I an might add this. Team of no panicking tonight. Never. <laughs> A, a yeah, lot, big part of our job is when people come to us with uh, that look on their face is to just straight lace. Don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I would ask add a lot of the common plugins that, that people use, particularly Yoast's um, SEO plugin. Mm -hmm. it, it has the ability to add nofollow to um, to your tag and category pages. Oh, okay. Oh. That, then? So if you work, that's a good idea. Great. So no follow about on category and tag. Check button. I usually recommend that personally to avoid the duplicate content, and I also recommend going to a very specific to the post whenever you can. However, if there's a reason, for example, if your category is particularly strong and that is part of your navigation, it's actually the default in the Yoast to have it that way. But if your category has um, tons of posts, you know, if you have 500 posts on your blog and there's 50 in a category, it's actually a benefit to have a category subdivision that gives more relevance there without mm -hmm. getting the duplicate content. So it's always a, um, I, I, I always come back to the same answer usually, which is what's, in, what's the best thing for the users to do? Sorting through 500 posts isn't the best thing for users to do. Um, you know, s sorting through a highly, a sm small, a sl smaller selection of 10 posts that are just about, I'm going to obsess about school shoes, um, that are just about school shoes and selecting them and all that kind of good stuff, that's more relevant to what they're doing so they don't have to look at, you know, travel ideas or whatever. So you would there. recommend the least amount of um, categorization as possible, so one category, maybe two if you had to. Yeah, highly relevant things. Things that are, um, I, I, there's, there's a question I know that's, that was out there about Keystone content. You you have themes of, of the things that you really you you really um, on about right that are really particularly important to the to what you are and dividing into those big things are good things. That's what that's where the difference between tags and categories comes in. I think categories it it can be very very good for the users. Tags are where it gets really challenging because you can have hundreds or or dozens of those many times with only one item in each one. That's where the duplicate content gets most created uh, versus categories. You, especially if you're really good about putting one piece of content in one category, mm -hmm. then you don't have that same. Okay. I think I need to go work on that just a little bit, but I'm not panicked. So, um, Jillian, Actually, I know that you have, have a that. question. Um, yes, I was wondering about um, how important theme is for SE, <coughs> and if it is important, what which themes are would you recommend? Um... As far as themes, um, I don't. I, a lot of them try and implement the Yoast plugin, which Steve and I talk about a lot. Uh, they try and prepare it for it because it's it's one of the best two plugins out there for your SEO. Um, as far as as far as a, a theme that I would choose, I usually look at um, how responsive. Um, as far as speed, I'm saying they're, they're, the new hot topic lately is a responsive design. Um, so uh, you can have a good mobile uh, user experience on your website. But when I, um, in this context, I mean, I'm thinking it's, it's not a pretty heavy signal, but um, Google does pay attention to your site speed. If, you're, if it takes a long time for your pages to load, that's less of your content they're actually going to crawl. And on the flip side of that, um, the longer it takes your page to load, uh, the more often, as the seconds increase as your page loads, the more uh, uh, users are going to bounce off of your site. So my first choice in, as far as a theme is always how fast is it? How fast is it? And how easy is it to use? The two I usually go to is Genesis, and then um, Steve turned me on to Woo themes. I really like them a lot. Um, Thesis, I thought I heard brought up before. I don't know much about them, but the two that I usually lean to are Genesis and Woo themes. 
Okay. Yeah, I think it's it's easier to find anything can be made good for SEO, but there are a few that are probably bad for SEO. Um, you know, that have a lot of overhead or really complicated things or um, a lot of really challenging, crazy stuff. Is he freezing? Oh, he's freezing again. Yeah, he's freezing. <laughs> can do. Uh, oh, sorry. Maybe I'll just stop moving. Um, if you're, um, if you have a lot of drag and droppy kind of stuff, that's where you tend to um, sometimes have a lot of overhead that's in there. Responsive is a key, though, um, in terms of the mobile experience. Mobile is is increasingly important, and I think everybody knows that. So, if I were starting any single theme out today, I would look for one that's responsive. Um, and let's go to Jamie. I know you had a question about speed and then another question. Well, what's consider considered fast speed, I guess? Because <laughs> it seems like every blog I go to is, is considered slow on, like, my page rank toolbar thing. So what's considered fast? Um, if I don't get a site that I'm working on loading in under a second, I'm not happy. Uh, under one second? Under one second. Okay. <laughs> well, and it's, it's it, you know, you're not going to, you know, you're obviously doing well. Your site's doing fine right now, so if it's taken two, three, four seconds, you know, it's all right. But there's all, you know, there's often things that you can do to uh, increase your speed. I know I talked to Holly at one point. Um, some of her pages were ro uh, loading uh, very slowly, and I noticed that she was using the default uh, WordPress com comment uh, system. Oh, I, yeah, I know she's talked about this. She needs to put that on a different dev date. That's, so what they have is, um, uh, like, Discuss and Live Fire. Those uh, chat systems load in an iframe. So they're basically uh, pages that load separately. So um, what was happening with her WordPress comments is the page was loading, and then, the, and then after all the content is loaded, then the database has to go back and it has to look through and see how many comments there are. So when you get up, you know, to 50, 100, 250 comments, it takes a long time for the database to load all those. So when you use a plugin where where your comment section is separated out from uh, the actual page content, um, it's going to load a lot faster. Google is going to see the page uh, load by itself, and then the comments will show up when when they're ready. Okay. Well, and one of the things that I had never really thought of until I looked into this after Nathan mentioned it is that our most popular posts, the ones that do really well on Pinterest and stuff, oh, windstorm. <laughs> <laughs> um, those are the ones that generally have a ton of comments, and that is decreasing the load speed of the entire site because that's the po post that a lot of people are hitting. So it was a real problem. Right. Hmm. Okay. So, Jamie, what was your other question? Okay. Uh, yeah, my other question was about stop words, like for the whatever. Um, where's my notes at here? Oh, like when you search for a phrase, um, like activities for toddlers or shoes for school, <laughs> does it have to be in that, when you're focusing on that keyword, do you need to focus on that exact phrase, or can you just throw in the word school and shoes here and there kind of thing, or does it need to be that exact phrase? I'll, I'll hit this one. <laughs> yes and no. So you want probably if schools for shoes, uh, school shoes for school. My word, you can tell it's uh, that I haven't slept enough. Um, <laughs> I almost did it, it too. It's the targets that you're going after. You want to hit that certainly in your title tags and some of your key elements. But actually, it's it's detrimental for you to use the same phrases over and over again. Okay. Um, it's it's actually more important to be to be what you guys are good writers and and let yourself talk about you know like um, saddle shoes or other things like that. So you're not just trying to hit the same thing over and over again, but you're actually using a variety of words to describe that same phrase. Your your tip of the spear, if you will, should still be the same thing. You really want to hit a um, a keyword in some of your most in your strongest elements, the title and the URL. But you in the, in the body copy and, and things like that, be natural. Be, okay. be the way. So is it bad to use those stop words in your major elements? You want, the way you want to be. Sorry, I think I overlapped you there. Do, do stop 
No, I don't think. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about stop words? And maybe I think that there may be some people that don't even know what those are that may be watching. I'll just I'll talk about it from the the SEO perspective of, of everything. Um, the the every search is exact, and what that what I mean by that is when you type in shoe versus shoes, even though those are very very semantically similar, obviously, those are the, you're going to get different results back. Um, misspellings will get you different result sets. Areas will get you different result sets. So no matter what it is, even um, greatest in uh, fluff words or um, words that are just you know adjectives that are thrown in your stop words kind of stuff, those all get different result sets. Um, so again, going back to the keyword tool, which now gives you the exact result set for those searches, it's easier to match up and see how often people put those in. Do they just type school shoes or do they type sh shoes for school? Um, it's easier to tell now. Very cool. Um, Megan, you had a question. And I think we're going to go back to categories on this. <laughs> um, I have a question, but I have a follow-up like me that goes right with Jamie. So you're like you're like going for a phrase. All you need is that in the title is what you're saying. Like I don't ever actually have to duplicate that phrase in the post. Um, I'll, I'll start, and I, uh, Steve can probably jump in on this. I typically would, you know, put it in the URL in the title, and maybe even in the meta description. Mm -hmm. You want it. Let's say um, you want it at least once in, in the page copy. I mean, Google has an uncanny ability to determine context and what it's about. Like that, that's, that's the essence of what the page title and your URL is for. They're looking at that whole person. Those are your highest signals on what the page is about. So having the keyword in there is the most critical. Can you get away with not having that keyword in your page copy at all? It's, it's been done. There's, there are situations where there are websites that don't have a specific keyword anywhere, but not in the title, in the description, you are anywhere, but they're still ranking. That has a lot to do with how powerful your site is and how competitive that term is. But um, you can do it, but for, I wouldn't, I think what he was trying to touch on is is not oversaturation and not right naturally, because if you do, if you're trying to stuff in keywords, if it doesn't, if it doesn't flow well uh, for the user, um, it's, it's not going to rank well, because, I mean, just, Here's here's an example is if somebody clicks on um, one of your articles from Google, they look at it and they don't like the way it's written or they're just not feeling your style or anything. If they click back, that is a really small signal sending back, uh, being sent back to Google saying, hey, this user searched for this and they tried, they tried to rank, they tried this article and it didn't do it for them. Maybe this isn't the right type of content that that you want to rank for. That's kind of off, I don't want to say off subject, what we're talking about, but there's, it's more important for you to write naturally than, if you can make it work with what you're doing, great. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go around forcing things in there. So if, so like just to give like a specific example, so if, if like one of the keyword like phrases that I'm going for is like um, outdoor activities for preschool, I can just put that in my title, and then I'm going to talk about it. Everyone will know about it. I never have to go ahead and say, because that's what I do. I will find a way to try to fit it in, like even maybe a little conversationally, so that I actually say those words in that order. Well, I, I can stop doing that. Because it, it's 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 obviously be outside. You know what I mean? It, it makes sense, but I don't have to do it. Um, I'm not doing it, though. <laughs> You don't. You don't have to do it. You can try. You can try uh, writing it um, with synonyms. You don't have to use. I I tend to not try and stuff words in there like that or an exact phrase like that. You could write, you know, activities that you know that are fun outdoors, you know, or or, or rewrite it in different types of ways that are going to work in the ton context of what you're you're talking about. But the exact three or four word phrase. Um, multiple times in the body copy, or even twice in the body copy, looks phony. But do I ever need it once? 
because that's it, it's a it is a am I like monopolizing this? I'm sorry, everyone. But it is a little like awkward. But at the same time, I feel weird putting it in my title if I'm never gonna say it like that. It's obvious. So say I'm like talking about playing like hide and seek, right? So my things I'm talking about are hide and seek, but. I didn't think it might be a good keyword. I actually don't know. But say I'm going for a better one to go with a phrase, but when I'm describing how to play hide and seek, that phrase doesn't fit. I'm just I'm gonna like be okay with that. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll actually use a specific example here. So because you, you said outdoor out activities for toddlers, so if you went said this is going to be five great hikes that that are toddler safe in the Denver area. I'm making it up, but you kind of get where it's going. Your theme is outdoor activities for toddlers. You might put your title might be outdoor activities for toddle toddlers, Denver area, and then you're going to talk all about hikes. That's a very very natural way. It's probably going to be very high quality in the content that you're writing. The, uh, there's enough signals, and hiking and outdoor are related terms okay. by their nature, right? So Way if you than what, I, what I'm doing. I think you can, I think you're probably doing it better in than in a taxonomy. Can. It's a good. <laughs> that that's good. Um, Megan, you had a question about categories as well. Yeah, I'm not, like to follow up on that. So should did I? I don't want to overinterpret what you said earlier. So should like should I only use one category? You should, should only use one category, category per post. Only one category per post. <laughs> Ideally, ideally, um, I tend to think uh, that was a that was a scary look right there. I don't, um, um, and, and so, how bad is it? It's not. It's, it's not. If that's, your, it's, that's if, that's your, if that's the way you want things to be found and explored on your on your system, then I'd no follow the the category pages. But I, I tend to think of categories as navigation items. So you're going to have outdoor activities, indoor activities. Those are my big categories, right? Tags would be things like hiking, biking, blah, 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 right? That would break down into the outdoor activities and possibly would have only have one or two uses. So I want, I basically want to be, if I'm doing it my way, I do categories as this is where I want to be, right? In my home navigation. Can I give you a specific example? Yeah, so let's say I had an article that I was writing. We we're stuck on outdoor activities, so we, we'll do that. I could do outdoor activities, and I could do hiking, both as categories. But I would, unless I had a subcategory page that was about hiking, I would go with the higher level page of just outdoor. And just and, get that? And just get that. If I was gonna, had a bunch of articles that were going to be about hiking, it would, it would be a sub page, a sub navigation item, if you will. Mm -hmm. I like personally categories for navigation because to me it's the logical way. It's it actually sets up a whole lot of doing it that way, way. Um, so that so people, people kind of can drill down, down into what they do. Steve, can we? Uh, uh, whenever uh, somebody's not talking, like uh, mute their mic because I'm getting a lot of feedback yes, yes, yes. right now. Okay, go ahead. I have a I have a follow up question about the categories from Angela England, who's watching. Um, does full post versus excerpts affect tag or category archive paging? And I think she's talking about the duplicate content. I'll I'll kind of I'll try and answer that. No, it's not going to be a duplicate content issue in that regard. And actually, that's that that's a good way to somewhat avoid. So, if you're on your category page, if I'm understanding the question right, which I may or may not be, if um, if on my category page I just have little snippets of each post, and then I go to read more on the individual page, the same could be true on my home page or anything else like that. It's a good way to avoid duplicate content because it's just a little snippet of that, and I kind of get that it's a navigational item, and I don't have the full things. Um, until I get into the full actual article itself. So that's actually, I think, a best practice, is to do a snippet on your category level and then go deeper. I hope that's what um, that, that, that makes sense. sense. To go a little beyond, beyond that, another reason I like to use snippets is if you have your full articles um, on a category or on the main blog roll, 
your users can read all that content on one page. So they're not clicking through on individual pages. So you don't know. It's harder to tell what, what, what is driving your users and what they're really consuming and, and, and what they're doing on your site. Because if you have all the content there, then, then how do you know what, they really, you know what they're really reading? Yeah, I love that. It's kind of like a, a election. You get everybody gets to vote for what they want to go, go read. <laughs> so, um, Dinah, I know you had a question. Yes, I am a complete geek, and I keep an Excel spreadsheet of the site changes that I make, just to see if there's any correlation with changes in traffic. And I noticed that my theme was incorrectly placing the H1 um, and H2 tags, which, well, maybe not incorrectly, but not the way that I wanted it. So I made changes in the editor um, to fix the problem, and my traffic went up a little. Does, is there any correlation with that? Do, do As a blogger, do we have to even worry about H1, H2, H3, and should we be because it seems like it's less natural or less authentic because it's more of an article writing versus a journal entry or a narrative. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense. And H1 is another one of those signals that you can use uh, typically on a, on a single blog post. Um, the title of your article, not the H, not the HTML title that goes in in the in the tab in the top navigation of your browser, but the actual title that the user is reading on the screen is usually tagged with an H1, um, and that's you know and that's another way when you were talking about when Megan was talking about do I put keywords in a specific place? I mean your title is going to be similar, the article title is going to be similar to the HTML title. Uh, in most often cases, it's exactly the same. So your keyword um, is in there. So adding it, you know, there's um, a likelihood that fixing your H1 tags um, helped in ranking because it gave a little bit more context. Um, I, I heard you say that you use an Excel spreadsheet. You know, uh, with it, they have a thing called annotations in Google Analytics, where you can go when you make changes. Um, to your site, you can uh, click create new annotation and okay. give it a date and give it a description of what you did on that day. So when you're looking at your when you're looking at those charts and stuff, those there's little little tag marks on days where those things happen. So you can actually see, you know, you can compare those dates uh, right within the chart, so you don't have to refer to your spreadsheets. Oh, okay, cool. And we're gonna go to Jillian next, who I think has two questions. Um, when you were talking about the keywords um, and the phrases, when you're saying that to have it just once and then just or you know not naturally be talking, I use the Yoast. I use Yoast, and I don't think it would give me a green light for that. So do I just because I think it requires me to have more? Any tool is a recommendation. Okay. Um, it, and, and that's a key to remember. It, it's good. It's like um, Scribe for SEO or some other things like that or even uh, Moz's kind of uh, ranking tool. They look for the diversity. How many places have you used this keyword in the, in the thing? Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to ascribe directly into what it's saying just because of that. So it's okay to get 50% on these. It's, it's, you know, it's not graded. It's graded on a curve. Okay. Yeah, it does. Okay. Um, and then my other question, um, as I'm experimenting with, with SEO, let's just say like with keywords, what's the best way to test out what I'm doing to, to find out if it's actually working? Nathan hit on it a little bit. It's the same, uh, as, which is a great way. Put your annotations in there. See, see what you see when you see it. Um, keeping in mind a couple of things. One, algo changes happen without your influence. Um, and sometimes you can see a ranking effect two weeks later uh, for something you did two weeks earlier, and, and those it, it's so delayed you won't know that, that it's because of something you did, but that doesn't mean it still wasn't valid, and you kind of look back and figure out what those things were. And then there, there's an opportunity to try and write for a number of different reasons. If 
you will. Like I was looking at those two very social media type of posts, right, that are going to have big hooks and uh, if they were written at the end of an article on CNN, everybody would have to click on it. Very, you know, and that that sort of thing. Um, I, it, I would almost refer to it as the Huff po Huffington Post kind of title, of you know what's you'll never believe the average bedtime of adults, you know, kind of thing. Okay, well, all right, I got to read that kind mm -hmm. of things. Versus no one's searching for that. Versus you know, girl shoes for going back to school. People are searching for that. That's it's a very valid thing. I have a question about that. Um, I was wondering is if you do get like you know the average um, you know bedtime and that post hits really well in social media and people are hitting it a lot. Does that affect search re results at all? Yes. It, well, the, uh, I think it will. Let me say that. Social um, right now, the, Facebook is very very poorly crawled by Google. Um, Twitter is very poorly crawled by Google. Um, not a lot of data sharing. Uh, Google Plus is obviously extremely well crawled by Google, so that's a little bit of a different game. Um, <laughs> you know, we're all here right now, so we're, we're among friends on that one. There's a huge benefit there. Um, those social signals are going to be stronger and stronger over time. Uh, it's just a matter of them figuring out how to take advantage of them without anything else. That transition is going to occur. Um, People have seen some correlations, but not a lot of necessarily causality, meaning if it's something that there's a lot of buzz about, often people will link to it, so it's hard to separate out um, the social effects from that. Um, we have a question from um, Jill Parkin, who's watching, and she wanted to know if she needed to put the keyword in both the title and the permalink, or just one. Um, permalink being the URL in, uh, I'm guessing she means permalink, the URL. Um, yes, yes, those are the two strongest signals. I would recommend it. Um, like I said, if it's a very powerful site, sometimes you can get away with it. But the, having at least, you know, I don't even want to give it a number, but I'm going to say um, an 80% similarity between the URL and the title. Um, making sure the keywords in there, but like, say your title's really long and you don't want to have a really long URL, you can kind of shorten it, and but still keeping those keywords in there. Those are the two because it's a, it goes beyond just Google. Is a user when they're looking when they're looking at a search results and they see those green links, um, those are trust signals right there. Users they've done studies and users actually look at those, and so if if looking at the title and looking at the description and looking at that green link, which is the actual URL on your site, if those, you know, all seem relevant, there's a higher likely a likelihood that they're going to click through on something like that. And um, Megan has another keyword question. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> I, I have five thousand. I'm going to try to stick to one though. <laughs> um, the to real quick. So to talk about relating it a little bit to Google Plus. I, I'm obviously, a, I am a little bit obsessive about the keyword. Do I need to be? Because if I'm going to share my content, anyone else's content, I'm going to try to put those keywords in my Google Plus post for that SEO benefit. Am I right? Like, am I doing, like, that's, is that right? I'm going to let Steve kind of answer this, but I, I, I do want to add, um, one thing that we often tell people is if you are, and can you mute your mic, Megan? Yeah. If you are, um, if you are l basing your success on how you rank for specific keywords, you're you're looking at it wrong. Um, it is as weird as it sounds, as you know, or is often this is what Google will often say to people, but it's it's true. Is you want to is you want to focus on the good quality content. You want to focus on something that 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 your user really going to like. Yes, uh, focusing on those keywords um, are important. Having them in all the right places, like we've d discussed before, but it's all right. You don't have to you, don't don't focus so much on just the keyword. Um, I would put more effort once you decide you're the keywords that you want to go after. 
I would focus more on the content. And, you know, put it in your title, put it in your H1, put it in your URL, put it in the title of your Google Plus post and stuff. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're spending more time thinking about, you know, where I need to place this keyword than actually writing something that people are going to go, holy crap, I love this, um, um, back up and, and rethink how you're writing it. But it, it would be that my keywords are always super general. So it would be like, say, art for preschool. I, I, I haven't been doing that a lot. And then I started to do it a little bit. So say I'm talking about frozen paint. I started off never putting that in. Now I'm adding a little bit of it in. You're saying that I shouldn't even worry about it. Here's, here, here's the way I look at keywords. Um, auto dealers are the classic of it, because I always use this as an example. When you go buy a car that's not new, what do auto dealers call it? Pre-owned. Every single time. I've bought many cars during my lifetime, and I've never called that car pre-owned when I've bought it, ever. I want to go to the used car section and talk... Um, to the guys, right? That's the used cars or used car on that granular of a level. I know that 10 to 1 people are going to search for used cars versus whatever else. Art, um, I may look painting versus um, versus drawing or, or some, some down, a, a little bit lower down on the level um, versus finger painting or, or whatever else the case may be. That gives me a strong enough signal to know the way my users um, have insight about it. I use it, I, I tend to like to use it as the insight, not the obsession. Um, so yeah, you want to use your, you want to use your searcher's language throughout the thing. So if they call it finger painting and, and you, you call it hand art or whatever the case may be, uh, that's probably not going to do as well, right? It's just not. But if it's finger painting and you have to worry about whether it's one word or two words, that's not a big deal. It's just, it's really, it's really not. Um, every single, you guys probably have looked at your data, and although this data is getting a little harder to get now, um, this is a bad Google thing, uh, where the keywords that your sources are coming in off of are starting to get obfuscated a bit. But um, any landing page that you choose within Google Analytics and you look at it, you won't see just one keyword phrase coming in. You'll see several. You might see dozens. You might see hundreds for any particular landing phrase landing page with the keywords that are that are coming in from organic with enough traffic that's actually the ideal meaning you're showing up for not just one keyword set you're showing up for a variety of them and that comes actually better from a natural a natural language a naturally written post that's influenced by the right words to use more than so strictly targeted um, that it, it comes across as literally written by um, the SEOs that everybody doesn't really like. I think Jamie has something that um, kind of goes along with um, talking about keywords in that way. Uh, yeah, sort of, I guess. I'm, uh, I don't know. I, I've always heard to go for long tail keywords um, with like four words or more in a phrase. I know we're beating this keywords to death and you're saying not to worry about it. <laughs> but yeah, is, so is it better to hit a long tail keyword that's more specific but way less impressions versus a more generalized, um, broader? Yeah, long tail keywords that have some have some value and you can hit directly are actually amazingly powerful. Um, I'm gonna go back over to a screen share in a minute and I'll, I'll show you a tool to get some of those. That's actually really pretty fun to use uh, called Uber Suggest. Um, because again, it's the it's the real phrasing of what people are looking for. Right. Um, so hitting one of those, if if I'm going to obsess about a keyword, I'll put that in my title. I'll put a shortened version of that in my URL, um, and that that's where I'm that's where I'm going to do it. Um, because matching that for for a long tail version is is where I want to do where I want to be. Um, but again, you can you can miss it by a little bit and still do fine. So. Okay. Do you want me to, I, should I go over to that screen yeah, share? Yeah, I'll see it. Gotta, gotta find it, which one of my <laughs> windows it's in, so. Uh, speaking of Uber Suggest, Steve, um, 
anytime there's a PPC question, please don't throw them to me anymore because <laughs> that's that's not my wheelhouse. Like anytime anytime talks PPC, I always go to Steve or somebody else on our PPC uh, PPC team because I don't know. I, I think there was a question earlier in the night, uh, and I said um, Uber suggest uh, use that. <laughs> so, anyways, go on. <laughs> so I'm going to show you Uber suggest really quick. Uh, I think the screen share should be up there now, right? There we go. You guys see it? Yeah. Yes. Now I gotta find it. What Uber Suggest does is it actually scrapes. We the, no, um, we're seeing your we're seeing your. We're mom. seeing some password. Oh, that's bad. Hey, I'm supposed to reset my password, guys. Just so you know. Um, let me get the screen share. Please hold on. What can I say? <laughs> Five hundred tabs. <laughs> I do. It's. I'm, I have a real problem with it. What this does is it actually scrapes the suggested the suggestions that Google is making uh, in order. So this one, the school shoes, my current obsession. You can see school shoes unlimited. That's really interesting. Why would that be the second thing that they're suggesting? That may actually tell me something. Uh, school shoes wholesale. These are some some words that may give me an idea. What's even cooler is you can go down where it's basically school shoes space D. Uh, school shoes design. Well, that might be interesting to, to kind of target. This is absolutely fabulous. And you can see literally how many ideas are. There's 10 times the number of letters and a few numbers on top of that um, that can give you some suggestions for ideas. I want to write about school shoes. How do I want to write about school shoes? Go to Uber Suggest, uh, look at something on here, and, and be inspired by it. Um, and it's it's a phenomenal way to get that kind of good stuff. So like, um, that's equality school shoes for girls. That's you'll notice it it changed the order even of the way that I the way that I was searching by the suggestion because of the queue. Um, but that's that's a cool cool thing to search if if you wanted to write about back to school shoes. Steve, hey. you wanna, do you want to while you have your screen share up? Do you want to show her like how we kind of go to Google and start typing things without hitting enter? Uh, yeah, that's that's basically Uber Suggest does that. So, it, it it's sort of the same the same notion, if you will, uh, of ah, all right. I'm I'm not gonna do it right now because I'm just. But it, this this basically does that. That if you don't hit enter, if you stop at school shoes, and then you type an R. That's what the, that's what Uber Suggest is. Into Google. Into Google. Itself. So gotcha. th this this is a scaled way of doing that. It's pretty nice. Okay. And um, we are going to have one last question, and I think Jillian has the perfect question to end this discussion. Okay, um, my uh, stats are my my search stats are really really low. Like Jamie can probably nod yes. I think three percent, like three percent of my views are from stats, and I I have really I think awesome content, and I'm doing really well in social media. I, but for some reason, for search, I'm just not. I've been using Yoast for like a year, and I'm hitting the green light every time. So if it's not keywords, then where do I start? What do I do? I, I just I feel lost with SEO. Uh, I'll take a swing first. Sort of, sort of my ten-step plan, if you want to call that. It really starts with. Uh, taking a look at, at, at a little bit about uh, where you are successful now and then building upon it. 3%, yeah, that's a low number, but it's somewhere to start. It's when you're at zero that you really have to worry. Um, so what keywords am I, am I, are you getting right now, and how can you build upon that? Because Google's giving you a hint already. This is what it thinks your blog is about. So, um, you know, I'm on with a lesson plan, right? So... Ooh, home is it homeschooling or is it um, or is it um, you know augmenting tutoring right is is are those sorts of the fra the phrases that it's giving you uh, giving you some some love based upon then build on from that so take something that you're doing well um, even though it doesn't seem well and build a little bit on it uh, you know if you were a travel blogger um, and you were writing about Europe. All of a sudden, now I'm going to write about Istanbul because it 
Google's figured out that I write about Europe a lot. I'm going to write about one, you know, a little, you know, some specific city, and we'll go from there. Um, those those are some of the ways that I do it, and then I just really take a step back, look at your uh, your URLs. Are they are they working well, or frankly, even just get one of us to kind of take a peek at it, which. Um, never, never hurts. Those those external eyes are, are a positive thing. I'll let Nathan fill in a little bit more there as well. Well, one thing um, I'll do for you is is I could take a look at your site. Um, I, I won't do it right now, but um, I'll take a look at your site for you. I'll see if there's anything um, that technically jumps out that um, is really hurting you, um, and then I'll make recommendations or I'll help you out uh, getting anything fixed. Barring that, any problems like that, um, one thing that I like to do is when uh, Steve was mentioning about expanding on stuff that you're already doing well, is I like to, although Google's taken out the, taking some of our keywords out of um, analytics with the not provided, I, sometimes I jump into the Google Webmaster Tools. The data in there, uh, for lack of a better word, is terrible. Um, as far as metrics, like the numbers that they give you, it's, it's absolutely terrible. Um, the numbers just don't line up, they don't make sense. But they do. there are a lot of keywords in there where they say these are things you're starting to show up for. Like these are words and this is the type of content we think you're relevant for. So it, ignoring the actual numbers on those um, searches and just looking at the words and looking for themes um, that they think are uh, related to your site and, you know, um, creating more content around it, creating a hub uh, that links all that content together uh, might be helpful. Um, one thing that we're going to do here in the near future is is and then um, is talk about how to, like I say, don't um, focus on writing for a keyword is is one thing that we we like to phrase it as is writing for your audience. So when you write for your audience, you also have to find your audience. You've obviously have um, a social following um, and they're, um, they like your content, they're sharing your content. Well, maybe there's a bigger audience out there that you can help find and, and we're probably going to cover that is how to, how to find the audience appropriate for you in a future hangout or, or in a future post. And I think that's exactly what, you know, all this is, is we've brought in people already who like us, obviously, because they come back. And then um, just finding more people who, who can relate to our um, content, which is genius. So anyway, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. And thank you, Nathan and Steve, for um, putting up with all of us. <laughs> and um, we promise not to use the word keyword for the next 24 hours to just let it kind of like drift off. So anyway, keep watching because we will come back with another one um, if I can talk everybody to come back. So thanks so much, everyone.